So for this lesson, we're going to be looking at our probability investigation and introducing ourselves to our second unit, which is all about probability. So first, probability is a number that gives a measure of how, sorry, there should be a how here, of how likely an event is to occur. And probability in general is the mathematics of chance. So that's what we will be doing, is we will be determining how likely are some particular events? Are they more or less likely than other events? That's really what we'll be looking at through unit two. Now there's some really important terminology here that we need to be comfortable with. First is an experiment. And an experiment is a sequence of trials in which a physical occurrence is observed. So for example, if I was rolling a die and recording which number was face up, that'd be a perfect example of an experiment. Another one could be if I was flipping a coin over and over and I was recording the results, that would also be an experiment. Next is an outcome. And an outcome is the result that is observed. So for example, if we were observing the number, the die, lands on. So for example, my outcomes when I roll a die could be a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. I have six possible outcomes when I roll this die. Next is our sample space. And sample space is the set S of all possible outcomes for an experiment. So for example, if we're sticking with our die example, all of my possible outcomes, I could roll a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. Those are all of my possible outcomes there. Finally, the last one is an event. And this is a subset within the sample space. In other words, we're looking at some specific outcomes. So we'll define our event, and that event will consist of a few of these specific outcomes. So for example, we could define our event A. Let event A be rolling an even number. So the number of ways A could happen is I could roll a two, a four, or a six. Now you'll notice that two, four, and six, that is a subset of our sample space up here, right? We just took two, four, and six from that set and we made our own little subset. Okay, any questions about those definitions before we move on to this investigation piece? Yep, we can absolutely clarify the last two. We will continue to clarify this in the second lesson as well, even further. So sample space is all of my possible outcomes for a situation. So I wanna think about my situation and what are all of the possible outcomes that could happen. For example, if I'm rolling a single die, I could roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Those are all of the possible numbers that I could get. Right? I can't roll a seven, I can't roll an eight, nothing like that, just one to six. Then events are the things I'm looking for. So in this case, I'm looking for what's the probability of rolling an even number. So what I do is I define my event. That is when I roll an even number. Those are the events that I'm looking for. So if I look in my sample space, I find all of my even numbers right? And it's because my outcomes in my event have to be outcomes that are possible for this experiment. So if I'm just rolling a die, 
the outcomes I'm looking for have to be possible outcomes for that die. Once we start looking at some examples, I think that that will continue to clear up. Okay. So here's our example. If we were in person, we would work with a partner. And what you would do is you would look to the person who's sitting beside you and you would decide one of you will be player A and one of you will be player B. Each of you will take three little slips of paper and you'll number them one, two, or three. So picture it like this, person A has a slip of paper that says one, two, and three, and so does person two, or player B rather. And there we go. For each trial, each person will randomly select one of their strips of paper. So person A maybe randomly picks a two, person B maybe randomly picks a three. Now if the sum of each of, sorry, if the sum of the two numbers is greater than the product, player A gets the point. If the product is greater than the sum, player B gets the point. And if the product and sum are equal, neither gets a point. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you um, kind of a, a, like some example data here. Unfortunately, because we can't play this, <coughs> excuse me, virtually, but I will give you some information here. So for number one, let's say we play this game and then in the first one, the sum of the two numbers was greater than the product. So player A won. Let's say player A had a, player A had a one and player B had a one as well. That means the sum of those is two and the product is one, therefore A wins. Let's say for trial two, I'm kind of just making this up as we go along just because that's the best way we can do it. For trial two, let's say that player A rolls a three, player B rolls a two. In this case, the product is six and the sum is five, so player B wins. So this is a little bit confusing without the, um, without the actual pieces of paper, but we'll be doing and we'll be looking at all of our possible outcomes after. But here's what's happening again. So here's player A's slips of paper. Player A has a one, a two and a three and player B has a one, a two and a three. They roll these up and they each randomly pick one. So let's say for the first one, player A randomly grabs a one and player B randomly grabs a one. The sum of those is two the product is one, so player A wins. Player A wins when the sum is greater than the product. For the second trial, in this case, A picks three, B picks two. I'm just kind of making these up because we um, don't really have a way of getting this experimental data. So in this case, my product would be six, three times two is six. My sum is five, so B would win. We'll do one more together, and then um, I'll just fill in the rest with some random data, and then everything will start to make sense at the bottom. So now for the third one, let's say that A rolls a one and B rolls a two. So in this case, the product, one times two is two, and the sum is three. So my product is bigger than the sum. 
or sorry, my sum is bigger than the product, so we have A. So I'm just gonna fill this out and then at the by the end of it, it'll start to make a lot more sense. So let's just say we played this game and then we had A, A, B, A, B, and we have a tie, and then B wins. So this here is actually data I got when I did this in person with my class last semester. Um, but we'll go through and we'll explain what this means and how everything came to be near the end and it'll make a lot more sense. So when this experiment was originally done, we had one, two, three, four, five wins for player A, four wins for player B, and one tie. Now when I'm looking at this, this would give us what's called our empirical probability, also sometimes called our experimental probability. You may have heard that word as well. And empirical means based on actual events. So the empirical probability of event, that event A will occur based on past observations is the probability of A is equal to the number of times the event occurred divided by the number of trials in an experiment. And this could happen for any experiment. Let's say I'm rolling a die over and over and over and the event A is me rolling a five. So let's say I rolled three fives out of the 10 rolls, then that will give me my experimental probability. So we can calculate our empirical or experimental probability here of A winning. So we'll start by defining our event. Event A would be that player A wins. There we go. So my probability that player A wins is equal to the number of times the event occurred divided by the total numbers of number of trials. So how many times did A win? One, two, three, four, five. How many total trials were there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten trials. And if we reduce that, that is one half. Now, of course, let's say B was just extra lucky if you played this on your own, then maybe B would have more, and that can happen with our experimental probability. Okay, any questions? We're gonna move on to the next piece, which I think will further clear things up. So we'll try our theoretical probability. So theoretical probability is also referred to as classical probability. And theoretical means to be determined mathematically. So now instead of having to do an experiment in order to figure out the probabilities, I am going to determine this mathematically. And to do that, we use our probability formula. So we have the probability of event A is equal to the number of ways event A can occur divided by the total number of ways any event can occur or my total number of outcomes. So that's how I calculate my probability. The number of ways my one event can occur and I divide that by the total number of outcomes. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're gonna calculate the theoretical probability that A wins in that probability game. So without actually doing the game, we're gonna calculate the theoretical probability. So let's start by listing all of our different outcomes. Player A could have randomly selected A1, 
Then player B could have also randomly selected a one. That is one of the outcomes, one, one. I'll just do one color, it's too hard to flip back and forth. There we go. Now let's just continue writing out all of the different outcomes. Player A could have had a one and player B as a two. Player A as a one, player B as a three. Player A could have a one, sorry, player A could have a two and player B could have a one. Player A could have a two, player B could have a two. Then player B, A could have a two, B could have a three. Player A could have a three, player B could have a one. Player A could have a three, player B could have a two. And finally, player A could have a three, player B could also have a three. So now we'll look at the sums and products. So remember, player A wins if my sum is bigger than my product. Player B wins if my product is bigger than my sum. So let's look at the sums. One plus one is two. One plus two is three. One plus three is four. Two plus one is three. Two plus two is four. Two plus three is five. Three plus one is four. Three plus two is five. Three plus three is six. Now we'll look at the products. One times one is one. One times two is two. One times three is three. Two times one is two. Two times two is four. Two times three is six. Three times one is three. Three times two is five. And three times three is nine. So now let's determine what's larger, the sum or the product. So the first one, my sum is bigger than my product. If I look up at the top, that means that A wins. Next one, my sum is bigger than my product, so A would win. Next one, sum is bigger than my product, so A would win. Next one, sum bigger than product, so A wins. Then for the next one, we have four and four, so they're equal, which gives us a tie. Then we have five and six, so our product is bigger than our sum. So B wins. Next one, four and three. Four is bigger than three. So that means that A wins. Then for the next one, five and five. Oops, I made a mistake, sorry, to say five and six. Three times two is six, not five. <laughs> Should say five and six. So six is bigger than five, so B wins. And finally, six and nine, nine is bigger than six, so B wins. Just like that. So now we'll calculate our probabilities. So how many outcomes are there? There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine possible outcomes here. So let's find our theoretical probability. So my probability of event A is the number of ways A can happen divided by my total number of outcomes. How many ways can A happen? One, two, three, four, five. So five different ways. All over our total number of outcomes, which is nine. For B, we approach it the same way. Number of elements in B, or the number of ways B can happen, divided by my total number of outcomes. Number of ways B can happen, there's one, two, three. So we'll have three over nine, which is one third. There we go. And finally, for the probability of a tie, our probability of a tie, oops, sorry, 
are a number of ways we could get a tie. Divide by number of total outcomes is one over nine. There we go. Now one super important note is that the probability is always between zero and one inclusive. The inclusive part means that it can answer, it can equal one or it can equal zero, but it has to be within those two numbers. It has to be in that range when we're looking at probabilities as a decimal. Mathematically, we write that out like this. Our probability of A has to be less than or equal to zero, or sorry, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. So that is really, really important to keep in mind that all of our probabilities should add up to one. Okay, so now we want to show that the probability of A plus the probability of B plus the probability of T um, is equal to one for the numbers game. Oh, oops, I forgot to read this part. So I'll make sure to note that if we have mutually exclusive events, the probability of each of our individual events occurring is one. So if I have the probability of A occurring or B or T, I can add them all up and I should get one. So let's try it. Our probability of A was five over nine. The probability of B was, oops, right here, three over nine. And my probability of T was one over nine. So that will give us five plus three plus one is nine over nine. There we go. And that only works if they're mutual, mutually exclusive. So be really, really mindful of that. It has to be mutually exclusive. Okay. Now we want to compare these to our experimental. Although we were unable to really complete the experiment, we can still compare our solutions. So theoretically, we have that the probability of A is five over nine, B is a third, T is one ninth. I look up here, my probability that A wins is five over 10. So it's relatively close. Um, five over 10 gives us a half. And for A, we're at five ninths, which is pretty close to a half. But you can see how my theoretical and my experimental or empirical can be different. This often happens when um, I have a really lucky game or something like that within an empirical probability because sometimes it doesn't always follow what we would expect. Are there any questions before I move on to the next little bit? We're making really good time. Are we okay? All right. So when we compare our theoretical and our empirical probabilities, sometimes they're distant, they're different. This is due to what's called statistical fluctuation. And the number, as the number of trials in my experiment increases, the empirical probability should start to resemble the theoretical more, right? So if I roll a die 2,000 times, it's likely that I'll start getting an even number of outcomes because it will start to follow along with our theoretical probability. Similarly with this game, if I was to play this over and over and over, maybe 500 times, I would probably end up with answers that are very, very close to this and further from our experimental probability up here. Any questions before we move on to the last thing? All right, so the last piece is what we call subjective probability. And subjective means personal, 
determined by a person's desires, values, um, reasons, whatever the case may be. Um, now it can also be an educated guess if I have a subjective probability. And the type of probability needs to be accompanied by an explanation of the person's reasoning process, right? So if you are just deciding what you think a probability will be, or you're giving a bit of an estimation, it is important that we explain why we think the way we do. So here's an example. There's a 90% probability that I will go with my friends to the movies because I really wanna go, but I haven't really been feeling well lately, right? There's a 90% probability I'll go. We can't really calculate that, but it does give us, um, but I wanna make an educated guess. Like I'm very sure I'll be there, oh, but there is this like one-off thing that could happen that could stop me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through these and determine if they're experimental, theoretical, or subjective. So for the first one, the probability of drawing a king from a standard deck of 52 cards is one over three. That's just a matter of a fact statement, so we're definitely looking at theoretical. Okay. The next part for part B says the probability that your mom will make meatloaf for dinner is 25%. Really hard for us to calculate that for sure, um, but it's based off of probably some background knowledge, a bit of a gut feeling, things like that. So that's what's called subjective. There we go. And then our probability of rolling a one on a single sided die after 34 trials is 13 over 34. So in this case, we did 34 trials. So that idea of trials tells us that it is empirical. There we go. Then the probability you will get asked to prom is 75%. Again, hard to really calculate that. You're just calculating it based off of some maybe well-known parameters, but you can't confirm it for sure. So this would be subjective. And finally, the probability of rolling doubles with two dice is one-sixth. So in that case, there's no experiment, there's no trials. So that would be theoretical. All right, are there any questions about any of that? I think that's it, it's a pretty short one. Any questions at all? If there are, I'm more than happy to answer it. But if you're feeling just a little confused, the lesson 2.2 will really clear things up for you. Are there any questions at all? We're so quiet today. Okay. So if there aren't any questions, let's stop the recording.